Take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Last week we looked at the shepherds coming. We talked about their coming to the manger and that they came with one purpose and one thing in mind, and that was worship. And that as we come to this Christmas season, that ought to be at the forefront of our thoughts is worship. Today we want to look at the magi that came. Some call them the wise men, some call them the kings. We've been more influenced, I think, by the song, We Three Kings of Orient Are, Bearing Gifts We Traveled So Far, than we have by the Scripture. Uh, You know, when you come to this, Matthew tells us, as we'll see in a minute, that after Jesus was born, it's very nebulous, it's very general, there's no time frame. They're obviously not there when the shepherds are there. This probably could be anywhere up to two years after Jesus' birth that, he, that the shepherds actually came. I've always been amused by a story Mary and Bill Parker tell about Jay, their son, when he was growing up. And they would put out the manger scene and the, and the creche and everything at Christmas time. And he would take the wise men off of it and set them across the room because they weren't there yet. I like that. That's a literalist of Scripture, if ever... I saw one. Because it's important to understand, the Bible doesn't say there were three. It just says some some men came after Jesus was born. It also doesn't say, I'm sure that we got the three by the fact, and we'll talk about this in a minute, the, the, the gifts that were brought. There were three gifts brought, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so we just assume because of that that there were three who brought three gifts could have been a hundred that bought three gifts for all we know but we know that they came in a very indeterminate indefinite time uh, we don't know that they were three. we don't even know that they were kings we three kings of orient are they obviously had means and and some wealth because of the gifts that they brought but there's no real indication they were kings and then again we don't know when they got there we just know that they did and when herod said you know when they went to herod and everything after that he said okay i want to I want to kill every boy child under the age of two. We get the idea that he must have been somewhere nearing that age, that he wanted to be sure he got the Christ child. He wanted to be sure he got Jesus in that edict. So when we come to this, I want us to think more about who they are and and what their attitudes were toward their coming and what those gifts were all about than I do about the men themselves, perhaps, I would say. Hear the word of the Lord from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, magi, or wise men, from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard it, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he began to inquire of them where the Christ was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and that's the prophet Micah, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and ascertained from them the time that the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make careful search for this child. And when you have found him, report it back to me that I too may come and worship him. And having heard the king, they went their way. And lo, the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, our joy candle today. They they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And they came to the house, it's a house, not a manger, They came to the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother, 
And they fell down and worshipped him. And opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for for their own country by another way or another route. I think there's several things we can learn from these magi. There are several things that we at this Christmas season, 2,000 plus years later, can come to an understanding of what took place on that night that they came, on that day that they came, when they came through the, the Jerusalem, came through Herod's palace and, and moved on to find the one who was born as they expressed it, as they knew, King of the Jews. First thing I think we can learn about this that I always find interesting is that we, we learn that we may find true servants of God in places we don't expect to find them. These magi were obviously not Jewish. They were Gentiles. The scripture doesn't go into a lot of detail about how they knew what they knew or if they just guessed what they knew because they saw the brightness of the star. But we know that God was leading them and God was directing them and their desire was to find the one who was the Messiah. Their desire was to find the one that God had promised. So these Gentiles obviously had known something of the Jewish scriptures. They were anticipating, they were expecting him to come. They were looking for him. They were pursuing him in all ways. But we really wouldn't expect magi, wise men, from the, from the east to come looking for this one who were Gentiles by birth. We always seem to plan out who we believe are going to be believers, don't we? We always anticipate that they're always going to be just like us. They're always going to think just like us. They're always going to do things just like we do. Well, the Magi teach us very clearly that we may be surprised sometimes that there are those who know Christ and are seeking Christ and pursuing God through Christ in in places that we never experienced. Now, they will always confess Him. They will always be looking for him. They're not out just kind of in some nebulous way saying, oh, we're wanting to pursue God in our own way. They're looking for the one that has been promised. But many times it's very surprising to us where they appear. The second thing I think we learned from these magi is that it's not always those who have the most religious privilege or even the most religious training who give Christ the most honor. Think about John chapter 1, verse 11, as we studied months ago in our study of John's gospel, where, where John just says, you know, Christ came to his own, and his own, own received him not. He, he came into the world, he came into to Jerusalem, he came to those who had been given the law of God and the, the edicts of God in Scripture, and those who knew the Scripture the best did not receive him. When Herod called these scribes and, and Pharisees, scribes and and uh, others together, and he said, tell me, where is this going to be? These chief priests and scribes, where, where is this supposed to happen? They knew exactly where the Christ was to be born. And they knew that these magi had come looking for that, and they told Herod why it's going to be in, in, in Bethlehem. It has been prophesied by the prophet Micah. He made it very clear that even though Bethlehem was not the greatest city in all of, all of Israel, even though Bethlehem was not the biggest place and the most, most prosperous place, that's where Messiah will be born. These magi who came from the east who were going on God's leadership, not fully understanding maybe everything they were looking for, they were believing that Christ, the promised one, was here, and they were following to find him. And yet the chief priests, the Pharisees, the scribes, those who had spent their lives delving into the, to the old, what we call the Old Testament today, those who knew the prophecies, those who didn't even blink an eye when, when Herod said, where is he going to be born? They said, oh, he's going to be born in Bethlehem, because uh, Micah has told us that. They didn't give honor to the Christ. They were not willing to accept it because it was going to disrupt their own religious tradition and what they felt they had to preserve. Third thing I think we see here and comes out of that particular point is simply this. There may be knowledge of the Word of God in one's head, but no grace in the heart. There may be knowledge. There, there's all sorts of people. I had a professor in college who was a, a literature professor, and, and he loved the Bible as literature. And he, far better than I in those days, 
could say, if you said, where is this in the Scripture? He would immediately go to it and say, that's where it is. He knew. From Genesis to Revelation, he knew the Scriptures. But he didn't honor Christ. He'd never known the grace of God in his own heart. He'd never known that changing of his life by the power of God. It was all about head knowledge. And in the case of these scribes and chief priests and Pharisees, it seems to be that's really where they were. They knew they had a knowledge, but they were not pursuing the grace of God. There was no change in their life. There was no understanding. I think a fourth thing these magi show us as they come to Christ is they show us a splendid example of spiritual diligence. The indication is they came from afar off. They came from way away. They had been journeying. They had been searching. They had been following the star. They had set their hearts on finding him and seeing him who was born king of the Jews. They weren't going to let Herod. They weren't going to let weather. They weren't going to let terrain. They weren't going to let anything deter them from finding the one that they desired. They pursued, they pressed, and they went on. J.C. Ryle, who was a contemporary of Spurgeon living in the 1800s in England, he was a bishop in the Anglican church, he made this statement about these wise men and their spiritual diligence. He said, it would be well for all professing Christians if they were more ready to follow the example of these wise men. Where is our self-denial? What pains do we take about the means of grace? What diligence do we show about following Christ? What does our religion cost us? These are serious questions, Ryle says. And they deserve serious consideration. The truly wise, it may be feared, are very few. You know, I, you see the, you see the bumper stickers, you see the signs, you see the Christmas cards that make the statement, wise men still seek him. That can sound very trite, it can sound very simplistic, but I want you to know it is true. And these wise men, these magi, teach us that there is to be a diligence about our pursuit of Christ. We in the 20th century tend to think, well, we, you know, we've walked an aisle, we've made a decision, we've been baptized, that's all there is. We just kind of sit back now and wait till the Lord comes or wait till we die. There ought to be a diligence about us. There ought to be a spiritual pursuit about us desiring to know him better and deeper. That's what Paul meant when he said in Philippians, uh, when he said, listen, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed even to his death. Paul said, I'm a Christian. I was saved on the Damascus Road. I've been given new life in Christ. But that is not all there is to it. My desire is to know him better and deeper and richer every single day that I live. There is a pursuit. There is a diligence about that pursuit that we see here in the wise man and the apostle Paul expressed to the Philippian Christians. I I dare say that we take our Christianity far too casual in the 21st century. We take it far too flippantly. We take it far too nonchalantly. Are you a Christian? Oh, yes, I'm a Christian. How do you you see it? How do you know it? We let everything in the world sidetrack us from our pursuit of Christ. Whether it's recreation or whether it's uh, just tired or whether it's whatever, we let all sorts of things separate us and distract us from our pursuit of Christ. These men were determined to find the one who was born king of the Jews, and they did everything they could to get there. Fifth thing we learn about these magi, these wise men, is they show us a clear and striking example of what faith is. They came to that baby in the house, After he'd been born, they they knew by the star, they knew by what they had learned from other documents perhaps, that this one was going to be the king of the Jews. This one was going to be the Messiah. This was the promised one of God that had been promised not just by the prophet Micah, but promised all the way back in the Garden of Eden when when God said to Satan, you know, you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. 
He's coming. He's coming. They believed in Christ whom they had never seen. You realize that? They they had never seen Christ, and yet they were looking for him. They were pursuing him. There There was an element of faith in their pursuit. But not only that, They believed when the scribes and the Pharisees and and the chief priests were unbelieving. They went and said, we're going looking for the king. And they said, oh, well, the king's going to be born in Bethlehem. But they would not believe it. But these magi believed. Excellent example of faith. They hadn't seen him. They believed when the religious leaders were unbelieving. But not only that, they believed when they saw him. And what did they see when they saw this one that They declare as born king of the Jews. What did they see? They saw a baby. They saw an infant. They saw one who physically, as a human being, was helpless and weak and needy, sitting on Mary's knees with needs that a baby has for its mother. Now, we talk about God is is totally self-sufficient. God has no needs, and that's true. The aseity of God is the all-sufficiency of God in himself. He didn't need you, he didn't need me, but when he became incarnate in that little baby, he needed his mother. And that's what the Magi saw. And they saw that baby, and when they did, what did they do? They worshipped him as king. Didn't have all the benefits that we have of hindsight. They just had the present, and they came, and they bowed down, and they worshiped him as king. I think that's the crowning point of their faith. They saw no miracles to convince them other than a star in the sky, but they didn't see him doing any miracles. They heard none of his teaching, none of his preaching to persuade them. They saw nothing but a newborn infant. And they bowed down, verse 11 says, they bowed down, and they worshipped him. They fell down and they worshipped him. And gave him gifts. Again, these gifts were not gifts that he needed. They were gifts to acknowledge something. The first gift it says that they brought was the gift of gold. It said they brought gold. Gold is the medal of kings. Gold is an expression of royalty. Gold In our day, it's even considered great value. And people love to have gold, and they love to buy gold. They love to own gold. If you listen to all the commercials on TV, that's the only thing that's going to get you out of this world or through this world is buy gold. I don't know that I believe that, but they'll tell you that. But gold is a prized, and, and kings owned it. Kings possessed it in great quantity. Royalty. And so they brought to Jesus gold, acknowledging his right to rule, acknowledging that he is king in the ultimate and complete sense, king even over Herod who was ruling in that day. He was king of kings, lord of lords, to rule over everyone and everything, including their own lives. They acknowledged that. I see that again down in that last verse. We read verse 12. After they had worshipped him, after they had seen the child, after they had been with Mary, God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod, to tell Herod where he was, and they went another way. I see here that, that these magi, in bringing this gold and saying, here's the royal, here's the royal medal for this king, was also more willing to listen to God the real king, than they were the earthly king. They were much like Peter and John when they were called before the the authorities in the book of Acts and told to stop preaching in the name, stop preaching the name of Jesus. And they said, listen, you do whatever you've got to do, but as for us, we cannot help but speak this name. And they did. The Magi acknowledged him through their giving of gold to be the king. Then they brought incense. Incense is is a, or frankincense is an incense that was used in temple worship. Many times the the, the frankincense was mixed with oil and anointed the 
the, the, uh, the priest, as they would go in to, to minister, as they would go in to serve. It, 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 this gift pointed to Jesus, as the writer of Hebrews tells us, as the, our great high priest. The one who not only is king to rule, but he is priest to bring us before God and bring us to God. It's interesting that frankincense in temple worship was never mixed with a, a sin offering. If an offering is being made for sin, they never used frankincense, never used this incense to, to bring that offering. The, uh, incense, this incense was always used in offerings and, and sacrifices that were meant for one purpose, and that was to worship and to exalt and to glorify God. And so they bring this frankincense, they bring this incense that is never used to, to, in sin offerings, and it points to our Savior's sinlessness, as well as his high priesthood. Not only will he rule, but he will intercede. Not only will he rule over his people and over all creation, but he will be our mediator. He will go before us into the presence of God and be our mediator. So you have gold that represents his right to rule. You have frankincense that points to his right to be our mediator, to be our great high priest. And then you have myrrh. Myrrh was an, is a strange thing to bring along with the gold and the incense from a human perspective. Because myrrh was a, was a spice that was used in the embalming process of one who had died. It was, it was a strange gift by human standards. It would be odd, if not even offensive, to bring to a baby and say, here, we want to give you myrrh in your infancy. This pointed to his death. It pointed to the gift. It pointed to the reason that he came. This was a gift of faith. This was a gift of looking forward. Again, we don't precisely know what these magi knew about Jesus and his ministry, and everything else. But we do know that the scripture was clear, that he came into this world to die. The cross was always behind the cradle. The cross was always before him. From the time he was born and those wise men came, and a little later the magi came, he was always looking to the cross, and they recognized that. Psalm 22 describes his death. Psalm 22, the psalmist gives those expressions in prophetic manner that he will cry out from the cross. You can read that very clearly. Isaiah 53 that Ricky read during our scripture time this morning, you know, talks about, especially verses 4 and 5, surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities the chastening for our well-being fell upon him and by his scourging we are spiritually healed by his scourging we are brought to life by faith in christ before god wow these men teach us about pursuit they teach us about worship they teach us about bringing gifts and so often our idea of bringing gifts is we think we bring gifts because God needs us. But I dare say to you this morning that as we come to this Advent season, this Christmas season, and, and especially this morning as we come to this Lord's table to observe the Lord's Supper, to think about what was going to take place and what was pointed to even by the myrrh that was given by those magi on that, in that early days of Jesus' life, prophesying that his death was coming as an atonement. There's a sense in which by faith we're to bring those same gifts symbolically before the Lord. I think we begin with myrrh. Not only does myrrh represent his death for sin, but it ought to represent also our death to sin. In Christ. It ought to represent the fact that we come to Christ and we lay at his feet our sin. That's all we have to bring. And we say, oh Lord, we want to die to that. Paul talks about that all through Romans. 
that if we are in Christ, we have died to sin. And our myrrh is to come before him and say, Lord, I submit to you. I die to self. I die to sin. And I desire above everything else to live to you for all my life. There is no life in Christ without death. His death and our death. And I'm not talking about justification by death. That is, that if we die, then everything's all right with God. I'm talking about a death that comes when we come to Christ. That's pointed to in the baptismal waters. When you're baptized, we talk about you're buried. You, you've died with Christ. You're buried in a watery grave. And you're raised to newness of life in Him. And so in this Christmas season, this Advent season, may we too come to Him with our myrrh bitter spice for embalming, representing death. And, and may we say to him, Lord, our heart's desire is to daily die to self and live to you, to diligently pursue you, to diligently know you. We come with our incense, we come with our frankincense, and that's our praise, that's our worship, that's our glorying of, in him acknowledging with our incense, with our worship, that we are just as impure as He is sinless. That, that we have sin and we need a, a cleansing through worship and we bring our worship to Him. Not for His good, but for our good, that we might be cleansed and renewed and made new every day before Him. And we come with our gold. We come with our possessions. We come with our wealth. We come that all, with all that we have. And we acknowledge, Lord, this too is yours. It's acknowledging his right to rule in your life as king, in your life as Lord. Acknowledging that, hey, I wouldn't have anything if it weren't for you. This all, but, you know, we kind of talk about, well, we give, we're giving 90% and we're supposed to give 10% to him because 10% is his. No, 10% is not his. 100% is his. The giving is just an acknowledgement that everything belongs to him. We bring our gold, we bring our cells, we bring our possessions, and we acknowledge his right to rule in our life. When you submit to a king, you don't say, now, king, here's the deal. You're going to get my life three or four days a month on Sunday. I'm going to submit to you three or four days a month and, and maybe just two or three days a month. You know, I'm, I don't want to go overboard to this thing. King, you can have it all three or four days. And when you submit to a king, you say, King, I am yours. I am yours to use however you so desire. I am yours to rule over and to rule in and to rule through. Lord, I belong to you. You see, when these magi came... Their attitudes were right. Their spirits were desiring nothing but seeing and finding Him. What are, your, what are your attitudes during this Advent season? What are your attitudes and what are your desires during this time we call Christmas? It ought to be pursuing Him. Seeing Him. Knowing Him, that I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed even to His death, dying with Him on that cross. What do you bring? When we come to Christ, the only thing we have to bring is our sin. If you're here this morning and you're you're not a believer, and you say, boy, I, I really want to get my life straightened out so I can bring something good to Jesus, forget it. We have nothing to bring to him but our sin. That's it. But we can do that. 
We can say to him, Lord, I thank you. You died on that cross to deal with this sin. I bring it and lay it at your feet. And once we've died, it's our worship. Our worship that keeps us rolling, keeps us moving. That's the reason the writer of Hebrews said, listen, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Don't let things distract you from assembling together with believers because that's where you'll be stimulated to love and good works and you'll stimulate one another. That, that koinonia, that fellowship together in worship is critical for your individual walk with Christ. And then the goal. Lord, everything I have is yours. I give to you. I give to you that you might be glorified and you might be honored and your gospel truth might go forward. That's what Advent's all about. That's what this season's all about. Don't let it be stolen by the Grinch or by Santa or by anybody else. I get in trouble for that one. Don't let it be stolen. It's about him. It's about worship. It's about right attitudes and right desires. Which brings us to this table. This table is totally and completely linked to that manger because it represents his death. His body that is given for us, his blood that is spilled for us, that we might live, that we might know him. If you're here this morning, you're a believer. As I say often, this is not the Baptist church meal. It's not the Grace Baptist church meal. It's the Lord's Supper. If you belong to him, I invite you to come to this. If you're a baptized believer in Christ, you've trusted him, and you're in good standing with your church, if you're here a guest, I invite you to come to this table. If you're here and not a believer, I ask you to think about what it means. Not take of it, but think about it as the bread is passed and as the, the, the fruit of the vine, the, the juice is passed. Think about the sacrifice that this little baby in the manger 33 some odd years later made that you might have life let's pray together